Good evening, and thanks for joining tonight's TI Technology Webinar hosted by Texas Instruments. For tonight, we're going to take a look at some data from the Climate Reality Project. My name is Mike Houston, and I'm the moderator for this event. I teach algebra and calculus near Pittsburgh, where I use TI Technology to make tough to teach, tough to learn concepts accessible to all my students. Tonight, I'm excited to be joined by our panelists, Tom Reardon. Tom taught at Fitch High School in Austintown, Ohio for 35 years, and he served as an adjunct professor at Youngstown State University for the last 39 years. As a T-cubed national instructor, Tom has worked on the development of the TI SmartView emulator software, uh, TI Inspire CX, and TI Inspire Navigator. Currently, Tom is working on ACT, SAT, and modeling activities for TI. Tom, it's great to have you with us. We're expecting a large crowd, so your audio is muted. Feel free to send any questions to Tom throughout the webinar using the Q&A window on the right side of your screen. We'll also be using the chat window to send general messages. As a reminder, this session is being recorded, and we'll provide a link to the event certificate of attendance as well as the link for the documents at the conclusion of the webinar. We hope you don't have any audio issues, but in the event that you do, try selecting communicate from the top of the WebEx menu and choose audio broadcast. So tonight, uh, Tom hopes to accomplish a few things. Uh, we're currently doing some welcome and introductions. Tom's going to talk us through, and, and we're going to view some slides from Al Gore specifically about climate change. We'll be looking We'll be looking at models mathematically, specifically looking at graphs and data from the TI-84 and TI-Inspire technology. We'll find out where to get this data, student gifts, as Tom likes to say, and teacher notes and solutions. And lastly, please stick around because at the conclusion of the webinar, we'll be giving away to one lucky winner a T-Cubed International Conference registration. And by the end of the webinar, participants, you should be able to model climate change data with the mathematics as learned in middle and high school. Uh, you should be able to learn to interpret normal curves with real world data. You'll be able to learn how to use a TID4 CE or TI Inspire to model that data. And you'll be able to derive the formulas for converting Fahrenheit Celsius and apply them. And lastly, we hope that you'll become more aware of the issues of climate change and what can or should be done. So we're expecting uh, experiencing some audio issues with Tom, so just give me a minute or so to try and resolve that. Thank you. All right, we are good to go. So let me uh, give Tom control. And Tom, you are unmuted. There we go. Thanks for uh, bearing okay. with us tonight. Tom, feel free to share your screen. Okay. All right, so uh, good evening, everybody. Sorry about the little glitch there. Um, let me get this out of the way. All right, so we're going to talk about the Climate Reality Project uh, that I attended in Los Angeles uh, previous August. 
uh, with uh, former Vice President Al Gore. And my main goal was to, to find, get some good data to model mathematically so that we can do good mathematics and become socially aware of, of some issues that are going along. Um, it shouldn't be a political issue. Some people think it could be. So please treat this as a mathematical modeling activity. Uh, also, I do need to say that the ideas shared at this talk are mine, do not represent any company. Even though this, this is a T-Cube thing, they're allowing me to do this, but this is one of those things that they don't acknowledge this or support it or not support it. It's just, um, this is just me. Now, also, you'll see uh, a, a website there. This is where all the data is, uh, bit.ly forward slash climate TR, TR for Tom Reardon. Uh, those are all lowercase. It is case sensitive. I'll have that on the next one. Let me just show you the website real quickly here so that you can uh, see what I'm talking about. Um, so you'll notice that there are two columns here. Uh, one is for the 84 activities, data, and solutions. And the other one is exactly the same um, activity except done in Inspire. Uh, each of them include the data, student worksheets or GIFs, uh, teacher notes and solutions. Uh, for the Inspire, it has a student version on the TNS file and also a teacher one and some other things that I'll talk about at the end. But you get all of this stuff, okay? I'm not, um, and there's, uh, I think, six activities uh, that hopefully we'll be able to look at. So when I went to Los Angeles out there, it'd be like me and maybe 100 people. It turned out there were 2,300 people there. Um, and uh, this is as close as I got to the former vice president. I got to take his picture on the big screen. Uh, I did get to meet one celebrity. I don't know if anybody recognizes that. That's Ed Begley Jr. Not sure why he wanted to have his picture taken with me, but I said, sure. Maybe it was the other way around. If I get those things mixed up. All right, so this uh, slides here, some of them I can share with you and, and many of them I can't because uh, they belong to uh, Mr. Gore, but uh, this one is a picture of what they call the blue marble. I think it's from Apollo 17, one of the first chances to see what the earth looks like from outer space. Uh, and I thought this was interesting. This is either sunrise or sunset uh, showing the curvature of the earth, but more so showing how thin the atmosphere is. And uh, the atmosphere is one of the things we have to kind of protect um, over uh, 110 million tons of man-made um, global warming pollution are being thrown out every day. So the biggest sources of greenhouse gases, you've seen these. I'm not going to spend too much time on that, so I just kind of point that out. But the largest source of global warming pollution is the burning of fossil fuels, according to about 97% of the scientists. And we'll come back to this slide in just a minute. Uh, CO2 is, is being re released in the atmosphere faster than any time in the last 66 million years. And the energy trapped is now equivalent to exploding 400,000 Hiroshima atomic bombs every day, 365 days per year. I don't know how that came over there, but I hope hopefully got your attention. I saw, I saw this graph, um, and uh, the first thing I thought of is, boy, this would be kind of a neat thing to, to model. Of course, I'm not going to be able to model all of these idiosyncrasies in it, but you know, do this. And keep in mind the reason we model some of the, one of the things we do is to predict what's going to happen, uh, as long as data keeps continuing to grow as it has been uh, previously. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and look at this one here. I'm going to look at the, on this one on the 84. So let me bring up the TI-84 here. And oh, before we do that, let's look at the um, student sheet, OK? GIFs, as I call them, worksheets, as many of you call them. So this is uh, the, the worksheet that goes with it. Uh, the, the picture is here. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on uh, some of the non-math stuff or non-modeling things. But if you look at the student worksheets, there are a lot of questions like, what's along the horizontal axis, vertical, vertical axis? What's the graph telling us? Some fairly straightforward, but things that need to be said, because kids sometimes just don't look at those, OK? Uh, what type of equations we use to model this, and so on. 
And I'm hoping that I'll say, oh, maybe it looks like half of a parabola or maybe a cubic or a quartic uh, exponential. Well, I hope not exponential, means just growing really, really fast, okay? Uh, and then it goes ahead and asks us to uh, do a stat plot and so on. So this is on an 84, but like I said, this have exactly the same thing done with Inspire with both the student and teacher TNS files. So uh, for this one, uh, to get the data, um, I had to go online and find the data, and uh, I put it into a program on the 84, and it's listed in list and spreadsheets on the TI Inspire. So the name of the program is Burn Foss. Remember on the 84, you can only add eight, up to eight characters, so it sounds kind of cryptic. So I'll go ahead and run uh, Burn Foss, the program. It says it automatically places uh, this data into list one and to list two. Uh, press enter to continue. And then since many of you might not trust me, I'll press stat and edit to show you that the data is there. And you'll notice that it's not every 10 years. I, I pretty much picked uh, years that were made a difference, okay? And if you press the up arrow a couple times, you can see it goes to uh, 216. You'll notice that I did not have 1850. I started with 50 for 1850. So you need to add 1800 to any year to get the actual year. Two reasons for that. One is it's quicker to type, and the other one is when you do regressions with very large numbers, you sometimes get weird results. So two things there why I did it that way. All right, so what uh, students would need to do is this, and, and notice, by the way, that this idea of, of putting the data into a program, I strongly, highly encourage it. Um, typing in data, especially a lot of data, just is very self-defeating, not a good use of time, so I highly rec recommend that. So the first thing we need to do is set up a stat plot. So um, we're going to go ahead and set up a stat plot, turn it on. And normally I would go with a scatter plot, but since my data looks like a line, a connected line, I'm going to go with the second one there. And my X list is coming from uh, L1, and my Y lists are coming from L2. And I like the second from the right. And blue, I'm fine with blue as a color. The other thing I need to do is set up a window. And if we look back, uh, I guess I don't have, I have the data in the list, so I'm going to go and just go ahead and set up a, a window here. And this is something uh, some teachers will say, I'll just have them use Zoom stat. Uh, I would wish you didn't do that. Uh, you're taking away that opportunity to find the domain and the range, and I think that's a very good discussion there. Um, so for this one, I'm going to start with um, 50, which was the year 1850, and go to 220, which is uh, 2020. And I'll do it in steps of 50 years. Y min, a negative one, even though I don't have a negative answer, I like to see the X axis. And it goes up to about 10, so I'll go to 11 in steps of one. Now I'm going to go ahead and um, let me go to Y. We'll see if I have anything in there. No, and then I'll press graph. And let's look at that and look at also, again, the data um, that we were given. And hopefully this looks like that. Um, in fact, it does because it took me about an hour and a half to get that data typed in and from off the computer. So, uh, yes, we do want that to be exactly right. So, one of the things you might want to ask your students about modeling is, and, and it's kind of it's funny in a way. I'll say, you know, do you ever wonder, like you'll read in the paper that we predict the population of Ohio to be so many million by 2020, and I'll ask them, you know, do you ever wonder how they come up with that? And basically, they say no. And so um, just I tell them there's some guy named Louie who's like a really good guesser, and they're fine with that, okay? And then finally I tell them no. Using the mathematics that we study, you try to model it with an equation and then uh, use that equation to predict. So for this one, we're going to go ahead and try a quadratic uh, uh, regression on this data. So uh, I'm going to go over to stat and over to calculate, and the quadratic regression is number five. By the way, the discussion of what types of curves model is, is a very important one, uh, so uh, don't, don't leave that one out. Uh, X list, yes, L1, Y list, L2. I'm going to store it into uh, Y2, so I'm going to press alpha trace to access the Y variables, and I'm going to use Y2 because it's quadratic. Just try to model. And um, getting a fairly decent R squared, but let's go ahead and see what the graph looks like. And so for here, you can see it's not really great, like the very beginning, but for prediction purposes, it might not be too bad, okay? 
Um, let me just show a Quartic, uh, and then we'll, and then I'll show you the, the the teacher notes and solutions to see that. So back to y equals and turn that one off. And let me just do a stat calculate Quartic regression. L1, L2, and store into Y4. That's the trace for Y4. And that R squared looks pretty good. So let's see what the graph looks like. And that looks really good. Okay, so um, the R squared was pretty good. The uh, looks looks pretty good. Um, and this is what we'd have our students do then predict what it is in 2020 and so on. In fact, we're using this one. Let's go ahead and predict that. One way would be to trace on the graph and say, I'd like to know what it's going to be in 220, which is the year 2020. And it's about 10 and a half billion gigatons of um, carbon. Okay. Uh, I also, since I have that in Y4, I could go off to the home screen and use alpha trace to bring up Y4 and evaluate that at 220. Same answer, just using function notation. Okay. So let me just pause there for a minute and ask Mike if there, if there are any questions popped up or suggestions. Anybody out there? Yep. So far, I don't see any uh, any questions. Lots of hellos from around the world. Uh, okay. But I was going to go. No over. questions yet. Okay. So let, I'm going to show you the, the student PDF on this one. I think I showed it to you before. There are a lot of questions we didn't get to because I wanted to get to the, the, the math and, and the techie part, but a, a lot of different things about predictions and so on. And then the teacher notes uh, have um, all of the answers there in bold, okay? And also, I, I try to include as many screenshots as I can in both the Inspire and on the 84, so that if you're not a not up, used to doing this, you can hopefully look at this and see it. And here, notice I can compare quadratic, cubic, quartic, and exponential regressions right here side by side and then be able to decide. I, I also encourage students to work in groups of four on these activities and have each student do a different regression, and that encourages the all-important math discussions and, and uh, friendly arguments. All right, so that's the first one. Let's go back to uh, the PowerPoint and go from there. So the next set of slides I found very interesting. Uh, these talk about summer temperatures and how they have shifted. Um, these years right here are, are important to me. I was born in 1952, so this is pretty much my uh, growing up years here. Um, and uh, this is summer temperatures. These are global, not just uh, for the United States. Um, and I'm not really the best statistician. Okay, that's probably my weakest part of the mathematics. So I got to learn a lot about normal curves and standard deviation and things like that. But what I noticed here was, and I would hope my students would see is, uh, the cooler average, average and warmer than average, look about a third of the normal curve or bear, bear, uh, bell curve, um, just to start. And so what we're going to do is we're going to call this the baseline, and this is going to be, quote, normal. So after this, the next 10 years, 83 to 93, you can see it kind of shifts to the right, okay, uh, skewed to the right. And one of the questions that's asked on the um, uh, on, the, on the student gift or worksheet is where is the median now? Okay, it used to be right at x equals zero, and now it's about x equals a half right here, which means about half the world now is considered cooler than average or average, and the other half is considered warmer than average. We're starting some new thing called extremely hot. That was that 10 year one. 10 years later, you can see again, it's now skewing to the right. Uh, the new median is going to be about at x equals 1, and now half the world is cooler than average, average, and a little bit warmer than average, and the rest of the world's here. And then the last set of 10 years, you can see that the median's way out here, and now that um, extreme is, is what used to be like less than a tenth percent of the Earth is now about 15 percent of the Earth. 
And so what I like about this one, it, it talks about normal curve, it talks about standard deviation, uh, interpreting mean, median, things like that. Uh, but let me show you the, um, the student worksheet that goes with this. So they're given the, the graphs, and then I also give them the bell curve and all the information about, a, not all, but some of the information about a bell curve, about standard deviation and what percentages they are and so on, uh, and ask them questions about that just to get them familiar with it. So I'm trying to teach other mathematics using, again, the climate change slides uh, to do that. And then we start talking about interpreting um, how this is shifting and so on. And uh, I do have to have a thank you here. Uh, uh, Professor Jerry Marino from John Carroll University is the person who helped me with all of this. And so publicly thank him whenever I do this talk. And one of the cool things he, he showed me to do here was uh, to find the area under the curves. You could actually use uh, the calculator here. So let me show you the teacher version of this. And so we guess this is about a third, a third, and a third. But here, if we use the normal CDF command, you can see that the blue is about a third, the white is about a third, and the red is about a third. So I thought that was kind of cool as well. So um, again, this is something you could use. Great. If you use part of it, great. If not, we've got other stuff to go as well. So, oh, the Inspire. Let me just show you real quickly what the Inspire looks like, because I like how you can actually import the pictures. You can see it's exactly the same as what was on the student worksheet, but now uh, it's there slide by slide. And then the teacher uh, one is exactly the same, except the teacher one also includes the answers to the uh, questions, uh, usually in green for green answers. All right, questions anywhere, Mike, at all? Anything? Um, I think the only question I saw recently was about the presentation and uh, will the dialogue be shared as well. And I, I don't think you do that, right? It's just the files. The the what won't be shared? Uh, someone was asking if the dialogue of the presentation is shared as well, and I think we just uh, will be sharing through their email a link for the recording. Uh, but as far as what you're sharing uh, with the Bitly link, it's just going to be the files for tonight. Right, and then the, um, so the dialogue would be they just have to watch this again. Is that right? Is Correct. That right? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Right. Uh, if, the, if the space is if this is going too fast or too slow, please tell Mike, and I can I can adjust for that. But it's hard to because I'm not seeing any faces. Okay, so again, this is another thing that I I really I like this idea of using um, real world data to, to teach some of the math that we we teach here. So after the normal slides, uh, there's a couple other things that popped up here. Uh, a little bit of information about climate change. Um, 17 of the 18 hottest years on record of course is 2001. The last four are the hottest. Remember this was done in 2018. Um, and we're now in the 41st consecutive year above the 20th century average. Uh, one of the things I do wanna get across to people when I talk about climate change, this is global. Uh, in July of 2018, many people died and several taken to the hospital in Tokyo during their uh, heat wave in, in uh, Tokyo. Also one in uh, Montreal, we probably have some Canadians maybe even watching this. Uh, at least 90 people died uh, in Quebec. This really got me here, uh, 124 degrees. That's not heat index, so it's, it's, it's uh, Humidity, and then this is really sad. I got so hot that birds just fell and died from heat exposure. So Greenland, we all know about Greenland. Uh, Greenland and Iceland really should probably change, exchange names. Greenland just had a better PR person, so uh, they got the name Greenland. And this is a picture, and it might be a little choppy on your screen, a, a video of a glacier. And as you can see, it's melting, and they're not really supposed to melt that fast. But I thought it was a good tie-in for this next one. So this is a slide that Mr. Gore shared uh, uh, in the summer of 1935. You can see a lot of ice and snow at this glacier. And then uh, about 80 years later, it's pretty much no water. It's all water. So no ice, no snow. 
Uh, and then I thought this was great how he found some data uh, and used this to superimpose upon it. So this is declining ice mass in Greenland. And um, the horizontal is years, starting at about 2002. And then this is change in ice mass in gigatons, okay? Huge, huge number, gigatons. And I, I just found this to be a very interesting uh, graph. Let me just pause this for a minute. Uh, one of the questions I ask is, why is it going up and down like that? And without giving you enough time probably to think about it is, even Greenland has seasons, so it has you know, heat, uh, summer and winter. And so, yes, it's going to fluctuate like that. Um, trying to model that curve will be a little bit nasty. Uh, however, I think if we use the linear equation to model this, we would kind of go right through the middle of it and kind of get an idea of a trend of what's going on, like an average of what's going on. Um, so, one of, so let me just go to the um, student sheet here. So Greenland, the student sheet. And this is what the student would get. Um, and then the, the uh, data on an 84 is in a formula, is in a uh, program. And on Inspire, it's right in the uh, list and spreadsheet, okay? Uh, but again, asking questions like what's measured on the horizontal axis, the vertical axis, what's going on in this graph and so on. All of these things I'm passing over. I'm trying to just get to the, the math and techie part. But keep in mind, I do want to appeal to a, a lot of different things uh, in these activities. Um, but my, the first thing I would want to have students to do is just letter I, without using the regression feature on your calculator, model the data with a linear equation. And I think this is an excellent idea. Um, is to have them try by guess and check, and they'll have to do several tries. And I've found what happens is students start talking more mathematically and thinking more mathematically. Like I have to move up the y-intercept. I have to make the slope larger but more in, in the negative direction and so on and kind of play around. And also some of them get kind of competitive, and I'm, I'm okay with that as long as they don't get crazy about it. Um, so guess and check would be a great way to do this. But for this one, what I think I'll do is uh, just go back to the, the 84 and illustrate it there. Uh, I'm going to be showing some on the Inspire 2 for you Inspire users. So I have a program called Green Ice. Again, my eight letters, Green Ice. And I'll run this. And it automatically places the data into lists. Uh, the years 2002 to 2017 in list one and the ice mass in gigatons in list two. So stat, edit, and you'll notice the years are, are written a little cryptically. So 2.29 is like 2002 and then 29 one hundredths into the year. Uh, in fact, they even tell us, I think it's like April something of that year. So um, I've had some people say, why didn't they just start like at the year 2000? Well, I think this is when they started collecting the data. So they decided to call this zero. They, they used that again as a baseline. Uh, this uh, April of 2002, they called it zero and then recorded it. And you'll notice it fluctuates, okay, how much ice mass is, is lost um, in gigatons, again. Um, so what we'll do is we'll go ahead and, and set up a, a stat plot, turn that back on. And again, since my original graph was connected, I'm going to keep it connected. And I think I'll use all these same ones, though I do have to change the window. And so for this one, though, I'm going to go negative 1 to 20. And negative 1 actually means 1999, but I'll explain that in a minute. Your 0 is 2000. And Y, I'm going to go with, uh, and again, this is where the kids would talk about domain and range. And uh, I definitely want them to do that. I think that's important. But we're going to stick with this. I'm sure you're all okay with domain and range. And let me turn off any equations or clear out any equations I may have. So here's the graph. Oh, oh, no. Oh, I must have goofed in the window. Oh, oh yes, my scale. So sorry, goof that. So negative 4,000 is my y min, positive 1,000 y max, and positive 1,000. So sorry about that glitch there. So again, my question is, is that curve look like this one? 
Again, the answer is yes, because it took me a long time to get that data in there. Um, so what we're going to do is have the students um, model this with a linear regression after they've done their, their uh, by hand one. And, and then we want to talk about what the slope and y-intercept mean. And those are, to me, very key. But let's first go ahead and do the regression. So off to the home screen we go and clear. So uh, stat and over to calculate, and down to linear regression, uh, L1, L2, and I'm going to store it into um, L, I'm going to store it into L2 because I think L1 is already blue. So alpha trace and Y2. And R and R squared don't look too bad. R is negative. Of course, the data is going planning down. So our equation right there. So um, going to y equals, I'll bring this I'll have bring this question to to you. The slope is about negative 276, and the y-intercept is about 849. And um, I ask my students, what do those two numbers mean in this problem situation? Let me give you. Uh, just a, a few seconds there to think about it. Again, here is the picture of the, the graph. And this is the equation that models that. So what do those two numbers mean? Let me give you a few seconds to think. So going back to the graph, and I know I didn't maybe give you some of you enough time, but it, it's funny when I ask students, this is what I get, I'll say, what is, you know, negative 276 in this problem? And they'll tell me the slope. And I'll say, well, yeah, but in the problem situation, what is it? And they'll say, it's the slope, like saying louder is going to make it better. But, uh, and they're, they're mad at me because it's like, you, you know, you've been harping on this y equals mx plus b all year, and now that's not good enough for you. Um, so the slope here, actually, if you look at it, uh, at the picture, I think is probably a better way to look at this, is this is the um, average change in ice mass that we're losing per year. How many gigatons per year on average we are losing? So change in Y over change in X. Okay? It's negative because we're losing it. And then the uh, slope, 849, I'm sorry, the Y-intercept 849 going back to the, to the graph is how many more gigatons of ice would be there in, the, in January 1st of 2000. That's when, when the, the y-intercept would be at year zero. And so it would be 849 more gigatons than what we started with when we called this zero here. So that's a, a pretty clever interpretation of that. And the reason I like that is, is um, Mike had said one of the things I've been working on is ACT and SAT prep for the last few years. And ACT test makers love to have to talk about what's the slope and what's the y-intercept in problem context. I'll ask that. So we need to do more of that, I think. So let me just pause there for a minute, Mike. Any questions or comments about the speed, too fast, too slow? Nope. Uh, no comments. Uh, we did have one uh, one comment earlier that things were pacing was great. So okay, keep that's it up. good. Okay, all right. So now one of the things that I just did recently, I was um, where's I um, at, at a math conference and um, at, oh CMC South and in Palm Springs, and uh, someone said, well, couldn't you really uh, model that? Um, Thing here with a sinusoid, and I said, "Yeah, except that it's you know it's like degenerating here." So let me um, turn this off. So I'm not going to go through how I did it. It pretty much was by guess and check, um, but I came up with a an equation using the amplitude and the period and the phase shift um, to get um, the curve. And then, well, let me I'll just show you. That was about as good as I could get. I'm not saying it's great, but um, I'm saying it's not too bad, okay? 
Um, probably took about a half hour to get there. But um, it was a good exercise. Now, if you look at this on Inspire, I thought we'd show you this on Inspire as well. Okay. Um, so this is the um, data here. And I'll, show, I'll kind of build it up for you. So um, I did the uh, trig graph. Here's the trig graph I got. Oops. Let me turn on the trig graph. So there's the trig graph I got that was like periodic with this and so on. And then I took the, um, that equation what was in that, that sine function. And this should look familiar. I added on the regression equation that we came up with, like the average regression. Watch what we get when we do that. I wish I could hear oohs and ahs, or maybe there aren't any, but I, I thought there would be some oohs and ahs on that one. I thought that was pretty cool. I'm not sure exactly where that might fit in your curriculum. I think my pre-calculus kids could do okay with this. Um, but anyway. So modeling, real data, also we're getting across the idea that ice leaving is not a good idea. We need, need to have the ice of Greenland and, and Arctica and Antarctica. So back to the slides. And so now we're going to have a little break from the mathematics. We'll talk a little bit more about um, climate issue. So 93% of the extra heat trapped by man-made global warming pollution goes in the ocean, and that causes many other problems. And I loved this graph. When I saw this graph, I thought this was really cool. I haven't decided what I could do with it yet, uh, except I just noticed that um, they called this pretty much zero, and before that they said it was cooler, and now it's a lot warmer, okay? Um, but the next graph I found even more intriguing is this is global ocean heat content and it's showing how not only is it warming up but it's warming up by depths and if you think about the consequences there if you're a fish that normally swims here and it's getting too warm your food may be going somewhere that you can't go to or you may be going to a different depth where your food doesn't live or where your predators are more you know more around more or whatever so again i haven't come up with anything for modeling this but uh, it's, a, it's just a good graph to interpret here. So this is, this is still bothers me. Almost 5,000 people died in Puerto Rico as a result of Hurricane Maria. Um, and it intensified from a Cat 1 to a Cat 5 in less than 18 hours, which is pretty much unheard of. Okay? Just, there's no, no way to warn people. And really, if you're on an island, there's no place to go. Hurricane Sandy, some of you may be familiar with Hurricane Sandy uh, in New York, which is kind of crazy to talk about that. Uh, in 1880, it would have been predicted this, that that to happen about every 500 years. In 2017, we, they say we can expect a hurricane like that in New York about every 25 years. And for kids who, will be, uh, who are in first grade who will be graduating the year 2020 or 2030, about every five years, New York's going to get hit with a hurricane like Sandy. Crazy. When town pores get bigger, the next two pictures are not science fiction movies. Uh, this is actually from uh, Montana, a picture from Montana. And this next one's kind of a video from Arizona. And just watch the big dump here. Hopefully that comes across on your screen as well as it comes across on mine. So the uh, rainstorms get more intense. There have been 16 one in a thousand year downpour events in the United States in the last nine years. Me just saying that is a lie. How could there be 16 one in a thousand year events in less than 10 years? But that's how things have changed. All right, so I do need to caution you on this. This is my favorite video. It's a little loud, um, but it, it, it just is amazing. This is Baltimore, Maryland. There's a gentleman who casually walks by in this at the very beginning, about my age, and then seconds later, well, just watch. Oh 
Sorry about all the screaming, that, that wasn't me. Uh, this is Miami Beach. Miami Beach now at high tides does have flooding in the streets. That's a common because they're very low, um, low sea level and the ocean levels are, are rising. So this is a common occurrence. Um, all things are getting more extreme, extreme temperatures, floods, mudslides, droughts, fires. And I thought this was a very interesting graph, not sure any what I could do with modeling it, but just interpreting it, I think, would be a good idea for kids to do. And since there's extra heat, um, evaporates more water from the ocean, causing the more downpours and floods, but also more longer and deeper droughts. And so I had several pictures. I decided on this picture to show this drought. Um, this in India has its worst drought in 140 years. I just can't even believe. I mean, that's just awful. Um, I was in California, like I said, last week, and uh, there were several people who said, oh, yeah, I know that lake. Um, and uh, three years later, there's no reason to have the dam. California's drought was the worst in, in at least 600 years. Okay, this is amazing. And of course, now there's more fires. Uh, the fire season in the United States is now three months longer than it was the year I graduated from high school. Um, I had several fires here. I decided to show this one from Napa Valley because I was there. Uh, my wife and I went there. I did, did some work in San Jose at a school district, and we went to Napa that day, not October 8th. And my wife said, we have no power while we were sleeping. So oh, don't worry. And we woke up the next morning and we saw the ashes in the sky and uh, amazing. This I thought was an amazing graph as well. Um, and I point this out for a couple reasons. Um, if you have not looked at the ACT recently, the science test, the science test makers love to have you interpret graphs. In fact, I took several ACT test science tests. I haven't had a science course in since 1972 in college. And um, I was able, without reading the, the, the passage, I was able to re read and interpret graphs for about 40% of the problems. Now, what I'm pointing out here is you'll notice the vertical axes, there are two of them here. And that's all, they love to ask those types of questions on the ACT science part. So uh, this would be a great way to help not only uh, teach about climate change, but also prepare kids for ACT and SAT and science courses. Department of Defense um, said that climate change will likely lead to food and water shortages, pandemic disease, disputes over refugees and resources, and destruction by natural disasters in regions across the globe. And, and that has already started to happen. This is from 2014. Uh, many of you are aware of the tragedies in Syria, and, but a lot of people don't realize that was started because of a 10-year drought in Syria, and the people have nowhere to go, and the government's not supplying what they need. So now that I've um, depressed you, let's look at some, some positive things that can, can be done okay, in the time that I have left. Uh, there are solutions at hand. Um, a, a lot of the clean air and energy technologies, the prices are going down drastically. These will be good to uh, model. Uh, especially the LED light bulbs. I think it's crazy how much they've gone down in the last uh, 10 years. And, and this is another graph that I really like. Again, two vertical axes, two different graphs. As one price, as the price goes down, the number of installations goes up. And um, so I do have this one to model, and I have this one on Inspire. So I do want to go ahead and, and look at this one on Inspire. Um, where is it? LED lighting. So this is what the student activity would look like. Though on Inspire, you almost don't need the activity because it's built into the Inspire, as I'll show in a minute. There we go. So this is, you'll notice it looks just like the um, student activity, except a page by page. Uh, here is the uh, data. So it talks about what does the LED mean and so on. I'll skip over these. They're not fluff, but they're just not what I want to look at right now. Um, so here's the data typed in here. And uh, so they can see what the data looks like. And uh, without giving too much away, it looks pretty much like an exponential decay. So 
So I thought that would be kind of a cool thing to, to do. Uh, and then I'd ask students to, to talk about what they would use and there's a difference between exponential decay and exponential growth and all that good stuff. But let me just skip ahead here to, um, I wanted them to do this by guess and check or trial and success. Um, and with Inspire, you can do that. So uh, on this page here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to use A uh, times B raised to the X power. And those of you who not use Inspire, just, just thought I'd show you that, uh, this. And when I type in this using parameters, it automatically says, do you wanna create sliders for those variables? And I thought, sure, I'd like to create sliders. I like to play with that, that would be fun. So uh, let me just set up these sliders a little bit different. I, I prefer to have them minimized. And I also prefer to um, set up settings. So um, I think for this one, I'll have it start at maybe 130, uh, a minimum of maybe 50. And, and this is something I have to play around with, the students have to play around with. A maximum of let's say 200, and let's go step size of one. And then for the B, uh, again, this would be something the students would have to talk about and play with. Uh, I think I'll start with maybe 0 0.3, um, minimum of 0 0.1, and a maximum of one, and a step size of 0 0.01, a hundredth. And so I have this equation here, y equals uh, a times b to the x, where a is 130 and b is 0.3. And then I can go ahead and play with these two sliders to kind of move around the curve, to try to curve fit it um, by best fit. And um, if I go back to the data, I think 154 is, is that y-intercept there, that first year that I had at 2008. So if I go to uh, 154, that'll go through that y-intercept. And then I can play, oh, no, don't go that way, and play with B. The students can learn and see what happens as the um, multiplier is increased there. And so maybe that might be good. Might want it to go through the last point. Maybe that would be a good one. So you kind of just play around with that. And also I could then have the, the uh, Inspire do the uh, regression equation with an exponential and compare them and see, you know, which one looks better, which one may be better for predicting, and so on. So I just thought I'd show you that. I kind of like the way uh, Inspire shows that. Uh, on the 84, you can do the same, this same problem with the uh, transformation app. And do I have that? I guess I don't. Darn it. Let me well, let me find it real quickly. So yeah, here it is using the transformation app. Um, you can go ahead and increase A and B and so on, play around with that until you get the one you want. So uh, it is a possibility. And then here's the exponential regression that you get from the uh, calculator on the 84. Let's see where we're going here. All right, getting close to the end. Mike, any questions or comments I should be aware of? Um, just one call or question about the the files uh, with the Bitly link. Um, okay. Your actual presentation that you're going through right now with the slides. Is that anywhere on that Bitly link, or is that something that uh, they're not able to get? All right, so unfortunately, I'm not allowed to share uh, the slides that Al Gore puts together. Um, in order to be able to use those, you have to um, go to his um, um, seminar. And uh, so I wish I could, but I'm not allowed to do that. But you do get all the other stuff, so hopefully um, that, that helps. But thanks for the question. Uh, in fact, whoever sent me the question, I'll, I'll, um, I'll just give you this since I couldn't, um, you know, give you the slides. I'll just, you know, send you a virtual PEZ.
All right, so some other graphs that I haven't yet uh, gotten to, um, solar capacity, um, looks like an interesting one. Um, and this one, I, I, was, I almost had this ready to go. Look how nice and smooth that curve is. Oh, just beautiful. But I just didn't get it finished in time. Sorry about that. But I hope to have that done in the next few days and, and put that on the website. But I just thought that was, looks like a math teacher made that curve. Okay. Lithium ion battery prices are going down. Uh, I also have one for this. We're just not going to have time to look at it. But exponential decay, pretty good here. Okay. So both on Inspire and the 84. Uh, is there a precedent for such rapid adoption of a new technology? And this kind of surprised me. Um, so here's mobile phone subscriptions over the years. You can see they kind of grow, grew fairly fast. But these are developed countries. Look at the developing countries. And the reason why they grew so quickly here is, remember, they don't have electricity. And so now with that, with solar power, they can get it. And, with, and they don't have uh, phone lines, but they do have, um, you know, they can get it from, from the clouds. So I um, thought that was interesting. This, is, it, I think, is amazing how students can have uh, solar powered, you know, inexpensive laptops there and get them powered right, right there. Um, the Vatican uses solar power. Um, the Chilean solar market um, is, is, is just um, taken off through the roof, literally. Uh, Chile is really using a lot of solar. You get the idea there. Uh, enough solar energy reaches Earth every hour to fill the world's energy needs for a full year. The problem is we we're, it's harnessing it, and that's you know the technologies that are being developed. Solar energy jobs are growing nine times faster than the overall economy. There are 4.7 times as many jobs in solar as in coal mining, and I'm not putting coal mining down. Any any peop, any job somebody does for a living, I admire that. It's just that I think we need to retrain them because we're if we're not using Coal miners, we need to retrain them for something else, just like in Youngstown, where I live. Steel mills went away, and all those people lost jobs and were flat, flat, out of luck. There was no retraining, no jobs for them. Uh, I also have a, a, a one on here on global electric cars on the road. Uh, nice way to uh, model this curve. Uh, and this one, um, you should be aware, in 2015, we had the Paris Agreement where every nation in the world agreed to work together to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Uh, there's something about the United States not being involved with that, but uh, by law, we cannot legally withdraw until the day after the next presidential election. So when people say we're out of it, we're not out of it. In fact, what's really good is many industries are saying, we expect the United States to exceed the Paris commitment. The government doesn't have to do this. Uh, the people, the, the um, uh, industries can do that. India and China are on track to overachieve their Paris commitments. Um, last year, about this time, the Friday after Thanksgiving, the United States government put out the fourth national climate assessment. Uh, many people there were, um, almost every government agency contributed and all, all the agencies came up basic with the same thing that uh, Al Gore has been saying, and that is the impacts of climate change are being felt across, across the country, and we're in, we're in trouble. However, um, we did get this response and um, from the White House. Uh, the quote was, you have to look at the facts that this report is based on the most extreme model scenario, which contradicts long established trends. Modeling the climate is an extremely complicated science that is never exact. And I agree with that quote. The next quote, we think that this is the most extreme version and it's not based on facts. It's not data driven. We'd like to see something that's more data driven. It's based on modeling. Pretty sure modeling is based on data. Could be wrong. You probably heard about Greta Thunberg. Uh, she, 52 year, a year ago, she went to a, a summit in Poland and basically told the adults to grow up. Um, and her, her talk to that is, is on my website. Recently, she came over to Congress and spoke to Congress. And um, she said, basically, I don't want you to listen to me. I want you to listen to the scientists and take real action. And she even didn't come by plane. She came by uh, a, a zero um, carbon boat, zero carbon yacht. Uh, these are two opposing views. Um, 
We talk about costs. We're not going to we're going to pay for this whether we pass a new green deal or not. Because as towns and cities go underwater, as wildfires ravage our communities, we're going to pay. We're either going to decide if we're going to pay to react, we're going to pay to be proactive. And you can probably guess who said that. Okay. The response to this was according Rather than worry about plastic straws and carbon emissions, Americans should just go out and find themselves a mate. This is a quote. The solution to climate change is not this unserious resolution, but this serious business of human flourishing. The solution to so many of our problems at all times and in all places, fall in love, get married, and have some kids. This was the rebuttal there. I, um, I'm, looks like I'm kind of running out of time here. I was going to show you the, how to go from Fahrenheit or Celsius to Fahrenheit. I'm kind of running out on that one. So, sorry, I, mean, I, I will put that up. I'll put that up on, I'll make a copy of that, and put it up on the web. I want, want to show you the web. Here's just what some people did to, in Europe when it got too hot. Um, but these are some of the things I've been doing since um, going to Al Gore's thing. And then, of course, this is his last slide. So let me just show you the, the, the website again uh, before, um, I think I have one minute before Mike needs to uh, take back control, and I appreciate his help. So again, if you go there, these are all the activities, uh, all the data is there. Um, this is the Cl Climate Reality Project website from Al Gore. This is that fourth climate assessment. It's about 1,200 pages. I have not read it, but I've seen every government age report it. There's Greta's ideas there. Um, if you're a Paul McCartney fan or a Beatle fan, Paul McCartney wrote a song called Despite Repeated Warnings About Climate Change. Uh, this will take you to that and also show you the words there. So with that, thank you for coming. This is something I find very important. I'm very passionate about. Uh, love to come to your school and speak about it. Um, but right now, I'll turn this back over to uh, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Thanks so much, Tom. Uh, so a couple of housekeeping things as we uh, wrap things up tonight. Uh, the first is uh, that we've been talking about the upcoming T-Cubed International Conference. Uh, again, it's a great place to connect with like-minded educators. Uh, if I had, uh, I was a betting man, I would bet that Tom is, is going to be there and probably presenting something. Um, so feel free to join us at the T-Cubed International Conference. Uh, visit our website to learn a little more about the conference, as well as some uh, current special promotions. Uh, that you can uh, you can get as well, um, and we said for tonight uh, we're going to be giving away to one lucky winner a T cubed international conference registration, and tonight's lucky winner is Robert Baker. So Robert, congratulations! We hope to see you as well as everyone else at the T cubed international conference coming up in March of 2020 in Dallas. When you leave the webinar tonight, a brief survey will automatically appear in your browser. Your feedback guides us as we plan future online events, and we really hope you share your thoughts in the post-webinar survey. Also wrapping up right now, uh, I think there's a, maybe about a week left, uh, is the Extra Credit for Teachers contest. Uh, this is a way that you can earn weekly entries for a chance to win great prizes for your classroom. Um, and so you can learn more about the Extra Credit for Teachers contest by, by visiting our website, education.ti.com. Uh, whenever you go there, uh, doing things that you probably already do, such as attending this webinar, uh, again, we'll earn, you'll gain uh, entries. Um, and you would need, for instance, for tonight, a code to gain some of those entries. And tonight's code for the Extra Credit for Teachers contest is Climate Data. I'm going to put that in the chat window. It is. Uh, not case sensitive, all one word. And that's again the code to be used for the extra credit for teachers contest. To receive a certificate of attendance, go ahead and click that link in the chat window. Also listed as a link for the documents uh, that I used uh, tonight. Again, Tom already shared his link for the documents that he used. Um, if you're watching this on demand, go ahead and copy that link into your favorite browser to receive your certificate. So, Tom, thanks so much for sharing uh, just a topic that you're really passionate about, and uh, hopefully this is something that we can uh, bring into our classrooms and, and have students become a little more passionate about it as well.
It was my pleasure. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. We hope to see you back online next week. Have a great night.